Hello and welcome to our final episode of the Technology Risk and Gambling Seminar Series for Season 2. I'm Associate Professor Sally Gainsbury and I am the Director of the Gambling Treatment and Research Clinic in the University of Sydney. It's been an absolute pleasure to bring Season 2 to everyone who has been watching and we really appreciate the efforts of the Brain and Mind Centre to endorse and support this webinar series, which is still serving an important function given the lack of face-to-face -face conferences. We really appreciate everyone who's been watching either live or after the fact and all your comments. I uh, will be circulating a very brief feedback survey to anyone who's registered formally for the series. Um, and it's just been a really interesting opportunity for us to bring content that we think is really relevant. We've talked about gaming and gambling convergence, which remains of a lot of interest to a lot of people in the field. We've also looked at topics that we've tried to make more relevant to a broader group of stakeholders. So we've talked about starting with how different stakeholders can actually reduce gambling harms to uh, talking about online treatment and apps and innovations in player tracking, what venues, what other organisations can do to start to prevent and reduce harms. And of course, we've had quite a few sessions focusing on either digital payments or cryptocurrency or monetization, because we do recognise that the way people pay and what they're paying for really influences gambling and gambling problems. So in today's final episode, we have two expert speakers who are going to be presented by Khalil in just a minute, and we're going to look at how to maximise consumer gambling data. Again, a topic that is much more relevant than only for the research field and even the gambling operators to look more broadly at what we can do. So without further ado, thank you again for tuning in, and I'll hand over to Khalil. All right, and welcome back, everybody, to another uh, great conversation that we're going to have this week with two different experts on uh, the use of behavioral data in uh, gambling studies. And uh, I'm actually really pleased to have both of these individuals on at the same time uh, because they both seem to straddle uh, two different sides of the same line, which is being people sort of one foot in the academic world and one foot in the applied analyst world. Um, so uh, allow me to first introduce Chris Percy. So Chris Percy is actually an independent scientist who's worked uh, quite a bit with BetBuddy on problem gambling related projects. Um, you may know him best from many of the different publications that he's published on this topic um, with BetBuddy in International Gambling Studies and other journals. Um, so we're really glad to have Chris Percy, who brings a, a wealth of experience um, as a, a data analyst and uh, an independent scientist. Also joining us is, for anybody who's been familiar with the chat box in this seminar series, you'll recognize the name Matthew Tom. Uh, Matthew is an associate in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a research data analyst at the Division on Addiction um, with the Cambridge Health Alliance. Uh, so, Matthew, Chris, uh, thank you both for joining us in, in this seminar. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, so, I'll, I'll actually first hand the baton over to Chris. And so, Chris, I, I, I know you have a, a very like unique journey into this world compared to, um, to others. And so, I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about your story, how you got into the field of gambling studies and how it led you to this behavioral data analysis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's sort of, it started in, started in 2011 when Seymour Dragicevich was just launching uh, BetBuddy. At, at that point, barely existed. He was doing this sort of responsible gambling analytics startup with a bit of his own time, um, no, no staff to speak of, no investments. And he was, he was looking for well, a statistician to help him analyze some of the data he was, he was getting and trying to build some, some models to understand which players might be at risk. And he didn't have a lot of money. And he decided the way he was going to source people initially was to pin some, some base, basically some post-it notes in the, uh, almost in like the, the, the staff rooms or the, the, or the poster boards of some of the universities around London. And I was just finishing up um, a statistics degree in Birkbeck, one of the colleges in the University of London. And I saw this sort of note on the board talking about a, a desire to look at trend analysis and to understand variance in the field of, of, of gambling studies. And I was like, huh, I'm looking for something to do. I'll drop him a line. So I did, and that was 2011. And we've now, 
he's managed to grow that into a, I suppose, a team of now a dozen or so people that was acquired a few years back by Playtech, one of the large B2B software suppliers, and runs a few of its own brands as well. They were acquired ooh, three and a bit, three and a bit years ago. So he's kind of completed his startup journey to some extent, and he remains, um, and I remain with him as, as a contractor supporting that, that research team at, at Playtech now. And we've really seen this, this kind of responsible gambling analytics field go from being kind of primarily an academic or, or a niche service. Pl plenty of analytics going on, of course, plenty of business information, always business intelligence always going on. But this field of can we use some of this behavioral data to identify who's at risk? But 10, 15 years ago, when Simo was trying to talk about it, people kind of weren't really listening, I suppose. And it's taken a few years and it's, you know, some of the, uh, the national lottery monopolies have done a really good job of incubating it and, and it's really gone mainstream now. So a lot of the commercial providers have got a service or they buy in a service. And the, the technologies that underpin it have become so much more sophisticated. So what I was building for CMO back, back a decade ago was kind of straight line regression models and t-tests to see whether variance was increasing in one, one recent sample of data versus a, an older sample. And now, and, and some of that, some of that w w w was, was sort of published for a core gambling audience. But now in the last sort of four or five years, it's moved into much more of a supervised machine learning domain. And now we're sort of presenting and collaborating regularly with with people who have nothing to do with gambling in their core work. So I was presenting at one of the AAAI symposiums last year, which is an AI conference, um, working with Neurex, which is all around uh, sort of neural networks as tools to serve, service these kind of things. And it's been a really interesting journey because suddenly we're not talking to people for whom gambling and problem gambling and the public health side of gambling is their bread and butter. And it's really, I mean, it's kind of really enriched us as a, as a, as a research domain. So I'll stop there, but yeah, I'd, Delight to be here and then kind of looking forward to the chat. Oh, you're just on mute there. Thanks for that, Chris. <laughs> and thanks for telling me about the mute button. Um, yeah, so it, it's really interesting, um, this space. And I, I agree with you, like this is happening and being incubated in a lot of different organizations throughout the world. One of the challenges, I think, in the field is that, um, you know, Bet Buddy and yourself are, are one of the few organizations that are actually providing some level of transparency around what's actually happening um, in the field. And so it, there's not a lot of um, learning across organizations um, or clarity in, in how effective any of these um, models actually are for intervening and, and reducing harms over time. Um, and so I think it's, it's actually really great the work that, that you've been doing. Um, Matt, you're somebody who's actually been working with some organizations to, to improve understanding and um, obviously with your organization as a whole, providing transparency in everything that you do. Um, and so I know you've put together a, a talk that um, I think provides some level of guidelines around how a researcher might approach dealing with this type of data. So I, I'll just sort of pass the conversation over to you to, to share what you've prepared. Sure. Let me share screen. Okay. Is it up? It's up. Very good. So, um, Khalil, thanks for the uh, thanks for the introduction. Like I said before, thanks for inviting me. Um, as, as you said, uh, Matthew Tom. Uh, this is my presentation, We're working with gambling industry operators and their data, ideas and tips. I'm just going to try to keep it light. So before I get started, I just have to do some uh, disclosures. I work for the Division on Addiction at Cambridge Health Alliance. Uh, currently, the division gets its funding from Epic Risk Management, Foundation for Advancing Alcohol Responsibility, Entain, PLC, formerly known as GVC Holdings, uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, MGM Resorts International, the National Institutes of Health, and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in the United States. Uh, just an overview 
Uh, the four things I'm going to talk about, not strictly in order one, two, three, four. In fact, you might find me weaving in and out of these four topics. Uh, the learning curve is about getting to know the gambling operator in their business. Uh, preparation in open science is setting things up so that when you get the data, you know exactly what you want to do and everyone involved is on board. Uh, some of you might remember the term open science from, uh, if I counted it right, Season one, episode nine of this series, and uh, my colleague at the division, Eric Lauterbach. Uh, third, data inspection is about making sure that the data is what you think it is and that you understand it. And finally, I'll end with two points about running analyses. Getting to know you. Uh, you might have to explain aspects of academic research to liaisons and decision, made, decision makers at the collaborator. Uh, just as a note, forgive me if I flip between the terms company, uh, gambling operator, and collaborator. Off the top of my head, in this context, company and gambling operator are more or less the same. Collaborators might include government agencies or other groups involved in the research process. Uh, one key aspect of academic research is academic integrity and academic freedom. Make sure that you work, that those you work with understand that your intent is to publish the results of your analyses regardless of how they turn out. It's okay if collaborators have their own ideas and research questions. It's okay to run analyses that test these ideas and answer these questions. It is not okay, however, if a collaborator pushes to squelch questions of interest, uh, squelch analyses, or results they find unfavorable. Have language in your contract with these collaborators. <clears throat> uh, that speak directly to you maintaining academic freedom. You, your home institution might have language in a document or on a website describing its position on academic freedom and conflicts of interest. Uh, there might be materials to point to or work from. Uh, another important aspect of academic research, especially in the gambling space, is the trend towards open science. Uh, there are many facets to this. First, uh, there's pre-registration, which means publicly posting your research plan on a website like the Open Science Foundation before commencing a study of secondary data analyses of a data set you receive. A uh, benefit of pre-registration is that it puts everyone on the same page as to what analysis will be done and how. Uh, a drawback is that it is extra writing and it does take time. Still, at the division, we found that the benefits of pre-registration far away the drawbacks. I'll get more into that later. Uh, another facet is the trend towards open data. Uh, part of our past work with groups like bwin.party uh, B1 party included agreements that we would be allowed to upload the data to our public facing repository called the Transparency Project. Uh, this might require some work on their end. Uh, they might have to make sure that any data sets they deliver to you and any data sets you intend to post on a repository are sufficiently de identified and compliant with privacy regulations like uh, Europe's GDPR. Uh, another step that companies might not be used to is IRB approval. Uh, educate your collaborators on what the IRB process is and how long it might take. Uh, learn about and tell your collaborators what your institution's IRB considers human subjects research and how it might affect logistics like secure data transfers. Um, actually, I wanna apologize for going a little out of chronological order. I just thought some things like academic freedom, academic integrity are worth mentioning first. However, uh, it all starts with your first contact with the company and what you do in response. Uh, in my experience, from my point of view, there's an initial cold call or email, and then later, there's a larger meeting with people on your research team and decision makers at the company. Uh, what you do in between those two is important. Matt, can I just ask you a question? Sure. Um, on the, I, I think first, I think that list of you know those three things are really effective and helpful to have. 
at the outset. Um, I'm just yes. curious, yeah, like making sure that there's clarity around those three items, um, you know, at the start of these conversations. I'm curious for you, um, obviously you're at a very high profile institution. Um, and, and I'm curious whether a lot of the conversations that you have with external organizations are, are inbound or outbound. Like, so it's, is it a lot of just sort of deal flow coming in to the Cambridge Health Alliance or is it typically you going out? Because I think how these conversations start um, obviously frames the way that the, the dynamic around the conversation will, will go um, as far as to these institutions' willingness to you know, accept these different types of um, constraints on, on the collaboration. So uh, conversations around these three topics, um, as I understand it, have been um, uh, the research the, the researchers um, setting sort of making the rules known. Is that what you're is that what you're getting at? So no, sure. I, I, so um, so I'm just curious as to you know it might be the case that a researcher will have an idea um, for an experiment they that they want to run. Um, but that requires access to uh, institutional data. Um, and they might send an outbound cold call request to try to get access. That's obviously very different than, say, um, you know, a, a gaming company coming to the researcher and saying, we're interested in a collaboration to study these items. Um, in which case, I think the researcher can be very strict around the, the terms and conditions. Not that they can't in both directions, but if, if they're too you know, strict, then they won't be able to do the project that they might actually want to do. So my experience has been the uh, the uh, gambling operators coming to us mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, at least that it's also it's also a question of uh, point of view. I've been on I'm a lot on the data analysis side of what happened. So I guess as we get further into this presentation, you'll you'll start to see where. Uh, start to see things more from my point of view. Sort of, um, in a research team, different people have different goals, and you get to and take different calls. So um, my ex my experience has been uh, hearing about uh, companies coming to let's say us or to another research group. Cool. Oh, I'll let you get back to it. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for interrupting. Sorry. Uh, oh, doing homework. Is that? Uh, so my first point, uh, researching the company, uh, general things like uh, where are they licensed? Uh, what games do they offer? Are they part of a larger network of gambling providers? Another tip I have, uh, familiar, familiarize yourself with the products. Uh, how do people access the gambling server if it's an online service? Uh, what does the user interface look like? Uh, how do people enter their choices like bets and in-game decisions? Uh, a lot of us uh, are in the business of studying gambling behavior. Uh, part of that is knowing what behaviors are possible in the first place. Uh, third, learn the lingo. A lot of gambling games have their own vocabulary and glossary and the players themselves might have slang on top of that. Learn it all. The less of the basic mechanics your collaborators have to explain, the smoother that big meeting goes. Uh, three more overlapping ideas in no particular order. Uh, terminology and mathematics. Uh, if somebody described a bet or a hand to you in a game, uh, could you do the arithmetic and accounting that goes with it. Uh, you'll need the skill later when you're sight reading the data that you receive. Uh, game mechanics, operations, uh, I don't have to get into those now. If people want examples of what I mean, we can talk about them after our presentation. Experiment with the play environment. Make an account and browse the lobby. Click some buttons and see how the display and the numbers change. Uh, get a feel for the mechanics of the games. Uh, when the Division of Addiction first partnered with DraftKings, uh, a bunch of us played some contests. 
Uh, I personally, I got experience researching teams, building lineups, and watching my predictions burn in raging dumpster infernos live on Twitch. It was great. Uh, no, I didn't commit cash or risk legal or conflict of interest issues. Free to play is okay. A lot of times it'll be enough to help you get to know the user interface. Also going through the lobby, note anything that might serve as edge cases or exceptions in your data. Uh, one example for us was satellite contests, daily fantasy sports, uh, where the prizes weren't cash, but were tickets to other contests. So when we saw those, the next time we met with DraftKings, we knew to ask them about uh, satellite contests and how the accounting might work in the data we receive. Can I chip in a question here, Matt, around the sort of reflecting on the free to play points? Sure. I think that's, I kind of, I kind of agree with everything you're saying. And it, and it reflects quite this. I, I often do the same. I sort of free to play. I very rarely do any sort of gambling or playing on my own account, but free to play. But there's a, the counter argument to this is kind of the, you know, the lived experience perspective. If you're trying to derive insights from behavioral data, and if you've got a member on your team or one of your co-authors is someone who, who plays regularly or someone with, with lived experience of gambling harm, there are that would seem to go slightly counter to what you're saying here, but is kind of in some quarters seen as a benefit because then they, they bring that perspective to the to the analysis as well. On the other hand, they obviously come at it from a more more specific perspective because they they have a personal view. I don't know if you have any any thoughts on how the pros and cons of that kind of balanced team can play out in practice. So what I can I can tell you that. Uh that when you have a diverse team and, and and we can get into this later you might have that pull from the, the the player side player pool side but then you get pulls in other directions from other members of the team and it creates a balance man i think uh, and, and you're I, often you're often that person right who has some lived gambling experience <laughs> that's able to at least <laughs> Purely from you know a poker side, which I'm sure you only uh, did for academic purposes as a, as a young man, but um, I, I I've definitely seen that that uh, idea play out in action, um, where you've been able to contribute insights to research projects just because you're familiar with um, what can be you know very complex systems in terms of the ways that individuals interact with these. Uh, platforms. There's there's so many subtleties. I think that um, I don't know, Chris, if you've had because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Bet Buddy's been employed in multiple different organizations, and so to some extent, you have to learn what those um, different institutions, games, and platforms look like. Yeah, no, that's and th these points about having a look around the lobby, understand it, the lingo, player slang, spot on. That definitely reflects my experience and our experience over the last few years. We're Particularly, so a, a lot of what we look at is slots. Online slots is kind of one of the largest by, by revenue, not necessarily by number of players, but kind of, for some players, it can consume quite a, quite a significant amount of spend. So we, we look at slots a lot. And slots, they're pretty complicated machines. They've, they've come such a long way from, I don't know, the first ones where you might just spin a few reels and see if three hearts come up. The features, the in-games, the, they're, they're fiendishly complicated to understand and explain and even if you just play a few spins, that's not really enough. You might, a lot of these games, they sort of, you sort of have to grind it out for 20, 30 minutes until features starts to come along. And it's the features which are key to the player experience. And if you're trying to understand what can entice people to you know, chase losses or to switch from one game to another, understanding that the nature of those features, some of which might come up once every few weeks, you know, and you know the features there, but you never get it. You know, keep playing. These are very hard to, properly understand just through a little bit of free to play so we, we, we i suppose personally as a research team we've become quite reliant on our colleagues kind of in in playtech or, or, or at the client side who build the games 
And not, not entirely, but the majority of people who build games are regular players as well. So they, re they really know the different features and what it's like. And we quite, quite often I, they might make a, a flippant remark about, I don't know, a stacked wild or about a certain type of feature. And very quickly, I find myself on thin ice with the definitions around what is a feature, what isn't a feature. And, I, and without those people in the room, to, they're, not, they're not necessarily researchers, but they're kind of part of the team because they're helping us source the data, helping us interpret it. Um, I, so I, I guess my point is I feel quite reliant on people who play reasonably regularly, even if their names aren't on the research paper. They're, they're sort of quite, quite key to getting this stuff right. That's an interesting point, and uh, sorry, Matt, I'll stop interrupting you, um, and probably interrupt you again later when you bring up another interesting point. Um, but just to add on to that, I mean, one of the things that often happens with these research projects is you have basically one person who's your client contact or your um, sponsor contact within the gaming organization, um, and you're basically reliant on that person entirely for being able to translate everything that you need to know about the data set. Um, and this game environment to you, whereas Chris being in an organization or, you know, having, you know, much closer working relationship, um, you have the, the benefit of being able to put together a team of, of people who understand the, the parts of that in a different way. And so, um, uh, Matt, I don't know if you want to touch on that right now, or if you want to just keep going, but, um, it, it's an interesting dynamic to be able to, to manage. Well, uh, just one thing to think about uh, along those lines. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that um, gambling games are, in, in some ways, are a lot like uh, languages. Uh, whether you want to talk about uh, actual spoken languages or computer languages, in that uh, picking up your first one might be hard. Second one, there's uh, it takes some getting used to, but once you get your fourth, fifth, sixth one. Um, there's a, there might be a lot of connective tissue and a lot of the same vocabulary. So you pick up your next one uh, faster or you realize this next gambling game that you're studying is one that you previously studied with a couple extra bells and whistles. Oh, I know how that works. Uh, and, and so there's some getting used to them, maybe some uh, faster learning curves as you gain experience. I definitely agree with that. And it backfired back for me last year or in a, in a, in a recent project because you, you get to know certain terms. And then you, in this, so this, this, this term was volatility, kind of key to understanding you know, the distribution of gambling outcomes. And you use it and people understand you and the conversation goes on. And then we started to get quite detailed because we were, we were, trying, to build, we were trying to build a label. We did, did a little A B test to put a label on slots games to help the player see how volatile it was. And we wanted to see if that changed, how much they spent, what games they played and so on. And then as soon as we got to the, the level of detail of actually designing this, we realized that several people in the room had different views on what volatility was and how it should be measured. And they all, like you put these on a chart, they all broadly correlate. Like they're, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not totally conceptually different, but we had ones that were really about kind of standard deviation of the, the, the RTP, the return to player on a single bet basis. That was kind of the cleanest, kind of an industry standard. And then we had ones around, if you start, if you start with enough money um, for 25 bets of whatever, this was in slots, but the same would apply to many things. What's your probability that you're still alive, you know, you still have money in your wallet at 50? And then you, you create a you create a score out of that. Now they closely grow, and then there were then, um, and that that's one that others call time on device um, or player volatility. But and then we had a third one around payout volatility, which was more the, the sort of the clean definition around well clean to say hard to measure, which was all around what's the chance is is this a game where the RTP is concentrated into few big wins. Or lots of small wins, which was the which is the one that if you're talking to a player resonates the most. Like RTP standard deviation, like you're really starting to lose players if you're trying to put this on a on a um, on a, like a one sentence label description. But if you say this is a game where you get few but big wins as opposed to many small ones, they kind of get that. That makes sense. Yeah, 
Um, but yeah, just the, and the, the mathematics behind some of these were fiendish. I'm <laughs> trying to pick one that, that sort of works was, it, was quite tricky. It becomes so important as, you know, we try to translate this back into um, like behavioral insights where it, you know, it might be dependent on something that's you know, as subtle as motivation. So are people aspirational gamblers who are primarily motivated by winning big prizes? Um, and in that case, it might be something close to the latter or people just looking for time on device, in which case they're much more interested in, you know, a, a standard deviation um, type metric. And even that might be more relevant to them. And so I think this is where it gets really tricky of how we um, interpret from a psychological standpoint or a consumer behavior standpoint what people are trying to um, target. That becomes very relevant in how we define things mathematically, um, you know, going into these systems. Right, and it's interesting you're talking about all these different people with all these different ideas. Uh, there's also different levels of uh, uh, vocabulary. Uh, some of the player might be familiar with concepts like EV, risk of ruin, uh, bank loan management in general, and then some of, some of your player pool might not. And so I, I can imagine when designing a, a system like that, uh, are you speaking to are you speaking to most people? Are you speaking speaking to that specialized, I don't know, 10% or 1% or whatever that's on the forums, that reads all the books, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, lots of different layers to this. Um, so <laughs> Matt, we'll get you. We, we derailed the conversation enough. Matt, we'll let you get back to the rest of your talk. It'll circle back. It's fine. It'll <laughs> circle back. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so, so my next slide, what do you expect? Uh, assuming those initial meetings go well, uh, the next stage, you're looking forward to receiving the data and making concrete plans of what you're going to do with it. Uh, based on how well you do your homework, you'll have some ideas about what the data might look like. Uh, what is each row going to represent? Uh, a bet, a session, person? Uh, what will the columns represent? Uh, are there any formulas like profit equals winnings minus... Uh, bet size. By now, we have at least a decade of research that uses actual gambling records. Uh, what variables did those other researchers use? Uh, what did their studies code books look like? Uh, maybe you'll get the same kind of data. A lot of gambling games have common or universally accepted data formats. Uh, will you be studying one of those games? Uh, can you and your computer uh, process the information if it comes to you in that format? Uh, my go-to example for that, poker. Uh, poker has a, uh, a very well-established uh, format for uh, describing what happens in a hand. So I, if I'm studying poker, in theory, I would want one person on my team, at least, who can read a uh, hand history like this, like it were normal text. Next, turning your homework into more preparation. Uh, while people at the collaborator are working on what it might take to get you data, uh, there are things you can continue to do on your end. Uh, one, write draft, I call it draft zero of the code book. Um, be specific about what variables you think you're going to get, what they mean, and how they fit together. Have some preliminary, preliminary research questions. Uh, many of them will come from those initial discussions and meetings. And with those two, well, you might as well start writing the pre-registration. Uh, as part of that process, uh, you'll be proposing analyses. Be precise about what derivative data sets you're going to create from the raw ones you receive. Be specific about what variables you're throwing into which models. Uh, personally, I don't like proposing a statistical method unless I can write the code in my head or can get enough information to start writing the code in my head. Chris, can I ask you a, a question um, kind of related to this? So a lot of the work that 
Matt does and a lot of the work that um, gets done in academics is structured around hypotheses, um, typically based on, um, you know, proving out some hypothesis, maybe some theory. Um, to what extent is that the model in your work or is your work more a theoretical where we're just trying to build a predictive model um, and we don't actually really care how we get there? Yeah, it's a really good question and probably across most of our things, it feels more exploratory than hypothesis driven. There's, there's often a few hypotheses floating around in the background, um, but it's rare. And actually, it's one of the things that a pu a publishing with IGS has helped us, has helped spark conversations within our team about the benefits of pre-registration. And it's something we, we sort of plan to be moving towards. To, uh, it's a common problem, but lots of the, the data sets are, are owned by the, the commercial providers. So we can, it's not much we can do on that, but pre-registration is an aspect of open science we should be able to move towards. But that'll be quite hard because we often don't have, a very, we've got a research topic. We, we can list the tests we plan to do, but we don't necessarily have a view on what the answer is going to be. Um, so with the, with the machine learning, sort of aiming to predict people who are sort of either self-declared at harm because of self-exclusion or they've responded to an online test saying that, you know, that they're worried about their gambling or whatever the marker of harm happens to be. I suppose the, the implicit hypothesis is that we think the feature variables that we're engineering are going to be useful. But in a sense, they, they either will be or they won't be. And we, we're happy to let kind of the cross-validation pr process prove us right or wrong. But, but even with other things, even sort of outside the supervised machine learning space, we, we've been looking a lot at game features recently and trying to relate you know, games that are more volatile. If, if you move to play games that are more volatile, do players then tend to lose more money or do they tend to have more declined deposits or other sort of not so much not brilliant markers of harm but certainly markers of exposure so markers of something um and this has been this has been very exploratory because there's there are theories every which way in terms of like volatility high is bad low is bad mixed is bad divergent is bad you know high one minute low the next is bad and so we, we didn't have a view we just kind of wanted to look at it and in the end, this is, I mean, this is a reflection back to what you're saying, Matt, around, you know, we'll publish regardless of what the results are. So we felt restrained in that by what journals are willing to publish, let alone what industry is willing to say yes to. So our first um, bit of finding on volatility was that on one data set it did matter, and on another data set it didn't. Some of the academics we were partnering with, or sort of not partnering with, but kind of advisors were saying, you know, kind of pick one because you've then got a cleaner story and you're more likely. And the first place, we, we didn't want to do that because we wanted to say we tried it in two places, got different findings. We then got rejected from the first journal and then IGS ultimately did, did, did publish that piece because they were uh, enlightened enough to see that there's value in things that don't necessarily replicate neatly. But there are all sorts of problems with, I guess, the academic process, even before you get kind of industry pressure, which is, is certainly a thing. And I won't deny that you know, Matt, you know, the things you're talking about, get it written down, get expectations clear up front, absolutely essential, absolutely essential as well. But that yeah. feels, it feels much more exploratory than hypothesis driven, which I think is, is an asset, but can also, you know, you know, brings with it risks, you know, the sort of the risks that you look across lots of things and then, you know, you cherry picking drives you to the interesting bits and they don't replicate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, like the, you, you, I mean, this issue is is everywhere in academia. It's just kind of um, it's just kind of hidden in the way that you know manuscripts are written up, where you, know, you might have a story that proves the hot hand fallacy, and then you might have a story that proves the gambler's fallacy, and you know, kind of have like a theory for every result. Um, which um, that's not like a perfect way of describing two alternatives, but um, the point remains that in in these types of studies it's interesting to think about what should be the role of you know analysts working in the space and what should be the role of academia and um, to some extent the two can get conflated so if if i were to think about what's the pure analyst role it's, it's really to solve the business problem and in this case the business problem is to predict things that are useful to create interventions that reduce gambling harm um, in the academic side probably like the purest way to think about it is to 
test and develop useful theories that can then be used to guide decision making by society as overall. And so, you know, a use case in that example might be um, we're looking in the data to try to find evidence of loss chasing. And if we can find evidence of loss chasing and that's associated with greater risk in gambling harm, um, then that's something that's useful for predicting, you know, the pathways model of problem gambling. Um, but then, you know, when we have these relationships with industry and industry data and academia, then, you know, those things start to get a little bit more murky where, you know, the, the firm might be looking for some sort of results that are helpful to, to them. Um, and, you know, the, the academic might be doing something that's a little bit more applied than just say a, a pure look at theory, not to say anything is bad, but you, it's, I think, useful to be clear in what you're actually trying to accomplish with a lot of this work. Because I often find myself, I'm like, um, I can find I'm much more interested in trying to solve the business problem rather than to prove out something that's actually more useful to academia as a whole um, in developing good theory. Uh, I don't think I was perfectly clear in my thoughts there, but <laughs> hopefully part of my point came across. Matt, I don't know if you want to react to that or if you want to just keep powering through. Um, so, from, I mean, just from my point of view, um, cause, um, well, as you know, I have my, I'll come up with some of my own theories or so of my own measures for, um, uh, for gambling behavior. Um, I, I, th I think we have to keep in mind that, um, and part of this partnership is it's not just um, us, them give the companies giving data to us. Um, to, to maintain that relationship, even beyond the first uh, first wave of data, the first um, contract, you do have to show them that um, one way or another, it is worth their while. Um, their data management team's time to get stuff to you. So I, I think there, there's there's a balance to be struck there. I mean, you, you don't want you don't want to keep you want to have longer term relationships with these companies as far as so you continue to get data, continue to do research, um, and I mean. It, mean, it might mean that you'll get to see uh, their player pool evolve, and now you get to do things that you wouldn't be able to do if every project you're jumping from one player pool or one game to the next. You can, you can maybe see some evolution over time. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting... Um challenge for the field in that, um, you know, we want to have access to all this private proprietary data, um, but, uh, you know, to do so, you have to create value in some way, shape or form. Um, and that's always a relationship that needs to be managed. I mean, the alternative to that is to, you know, just try to find uh, an interested regulator or policymaker who's willing to mandate access to the data. Um, but there's limitations to that too, because you know you, you can put in a data request. Um, like let's say you could access any data you wanted through a freedom of information request. Um, you still have to kind of know what to ask for, and unless you have the type of people that you know, like Chris alluded to working with, that are telling you what's actually important in the data, how to re really think about it properly, um, you're just not going to even know what to ask for or what pitfalls might be in the, the data that you requested. It might not be everything that you thought it was. So um, certainly a collaborative approach over the long run um, is, is the only way to really make sense of, of these, you know, very complicated data sets. What we've seen with, with some of the mandated data sharing, I sort of think of this more, more from a UK lens, is it's been, it's been very good for generating cross operator insights because typically op data sets tend to be single operator unless, um, you know, a, a regulator helps bring people around the table, which is great. What I haven't seen, and what I've seen produce good research, good insights, useful reports, and, and, and an exercise well, well worth doing. What I haven't seen come out of it, though, is 
a data set that then, like some of the brilliant, I mean, the division on addiction is, is kind of the leader here, really, in sort of having data sets that are then available for others to use. I've never seen that come out of the various bodies in the UK that have that have commissioned and either mandated or sort of softly arm twisted data that's then given to you know an entirely arm's length academic team to look at. It's never generated data that is then available for others. It's also never generated longer term, that's what I don't, I don't quite mean, more exploratory testing of ideas. So the, the regulator or the advisory board or the strategy board has got a series of questions they want to test. They um, procure an academic team to do that work. They then they then organize the data transfer. So it's nice, clean, arm's length, industry isn't able to intervene. That, that, that part is good. But that's actually not generating genuine exploration of other ideas because it's just whatever the regulator wanted to look at in the first place, which is probably a good topic, but it's not the be all and end all. It's just one out of many topics. And then it stops and no one ever looks at that data again. So that that's it's it's been quite disappointing because I I sort of as a researcher I really like the idea of mandated access with regulators kind sort of getting over the fact that there are obviously conflicts between different industry members who are competitors with each other there are commercial pressures so I'm I kind of really like the idea of a neutral or, or dominant central body being able to overcome those barriers but when I have seen it happen it's not fulfilled its promise it's delivered a good you know a good solid hundred page PDF with some great ideas in it, and then it stops. No one ever looks at the data set again. And that just feels feels really sad, basically. Yeah, and I, I think um, you know that's where we have to start thinking about, um, it, and I think that can be part of the solution, but I think it's also a case where we have to think about what are the other um, levers that can be pulled to try to incentivize the right set of behaviors that leads to this mutual collaboration. and. I've been an advocate for um, having either penalties or incentives for operators to directly address gambling harms. And so, if you know, if it's the case that your tax rate goes up, you know, 50 basis points or goes down 50 basis points, um, depending on how you perform on a set of harm related metrics, well, then it's going to be all hands on deck and you're going to want to integrate, you know, the smartest people um, that you can, like, you know, you, Chris and, and Matt, um, to be able to work with them collaboratively in in addressing these problems in however way um, can be most effective to do so and then you know that gives people like matt who are working in academic institutions the leverage that that they need to be able to say yes we're very happy to work with you but you know those three things that we mentioned at the front of the slide deck um those are all you know the the, the price of entry to be able to, to get access to this intellectual capital that we have at the division on addiction we we found it quite easy to motivate engagement in an academic process at least in terms of committing to uh, publishing results no matter what they are and attempting to publish them in a peer review process if we fail that at least you know at least get a white paper out you know on the website and present we've been able to do that with quite a high level of success for topics that are not well understood because they're I suppose they are in, in some sense of the word cutting edge no one quite knows the right answer for the analytics. So the, with the supervised machine learning to predict harm, we've got a reasonable understanding of it now, but we certainly didn't eight or nine years ago, and we still could improve a lot more. So it's been quite, and we're now doing some work on um, algorithmic bias and gender discrimination within the data. We're doing some stuff on AI audits and accountability. It's been really easy to get buy-in internally, kind of even within the system, even with, within industry, you still need to get buy-in. It's been really easy to get buy-in for that because there's this recognition that we don't know the answers, but by engaging in a peer review process, we'll get constructive feedback. By engaging in channels and conferences, we'll see what other people are saying. We'll, we'll hopefully inspire other people to share their ideas. And if, even if they don't do that, they will at least you know, bash our ideas as best they can, which is then useful if you're aiming to ultimately get those ideas to be as strong as possible. What has been harder to do is to do research in that kind of more public manner for things where they feel it's well understood already. So game features, they might feel they already understand those features well internally, for things that are more directly related to commercial objectives. So with, with the public health angle, there's a more natural, you know, the initial way in is through someone in compliance, then you assemble other teams as required around that person. But if you're doing something that's more around 
gambling behavior, commercial implications, different types of players, that's proved much harder because we're well, partly concerns over are we, if we come up with something really useful, we want to use it. We don't want others to use it. There's commercial IP that's being generated here, but also a sense of we know that we're, we're the experts already. So what, you know, why do we need to, to engage in an academic process? And that's, we, we've had some, we've had some progress on, on, on that, that avenue, but it's been harder to do that than on deploying a new technology where kind of everyone accepts that the technology is not yet mature. Awesome. Uh, Matt, we're, we've used up, I think, most of your <laughs> presentation time having these uh, side chats, which I think were productive. Um, but we do still have a couple of minutes before we go to closing comments. So I, I'll maybe ask you to fast forward through any remaining slides if there's some key points you'd like to make. And I apologize for that. But hopefully it was a productive conversation nonetheless. Um, Sure, uh, just some things I wanted to mention. Um, as far as receiving the data, start small, uh, test it, make sure that their, uh, data, their uh, data generation systems are working and that uh, you understand uh, what you're getting. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, it, it's easier to have a private email and it's not, and maybe not get the idea right and get corrected, then write a publication and need to get corrected afterwards. Um, uh, the real fun starts once you actually get the data. Uh, but uh, fun, I mean data inspection. Um, general stats advice, plot your data, stare at it. Um, see if you can pick out edge cases uh, like satellites, things like that. That's what we were able to do. Um, play with the variables, check your, if any formulas that you know are supposed to be there actually work. Um, be creative. Uh, I had this uh, one data set where um, it was supposed to be a two-year period. I checked whether every month, day, hour combo was representing the data. Instead, I got something like this, uh, where uh, the green zones, I saw there was something with that month, hour, day combo. Red zones, not so much. So I knew to go back and uh, ask them if they had some problems with their data generation uh, routines. Um, uh, about, that e about those emails, um, I point to two specific rows and columns of data so that they see what I see. And the more specific you be, the, the easier that email back and forth goes. Um, running your analyses. Um, note any outliers. You talk about big winners, pros, big spenders. Uh, this has to get back, goes back to what I was talking about, site reading the data. So you might see an outlier in a scatter plot, and then you go back to the data and you get that, per, that user's uh, lines of data. Can you site read it and see what happened and see if you can explain the outlier? Um, and as far as uh, pre registration, transparent changes are okay. They happen. You, the variables aren't quite what you thought they were going to be. Fine. Uh, your sample size has issues with maybe certain subgroups of people. Make adjustments and just be transparent about it. Um, and then just some acknowledgments uh, to Cleland Sod for arranging this and inviting me to come give a talk. Uh, division got my start in this field. Uh, working with industry did it. It's just been so much fun. Uh, the regulars in the chat box, uh, you know who you are, uh, you form the community around the seminar series. Um, and all of you for uh, joining us, whether you're here live or on YouTube after the fact. That's great. And Matt, um, I, uh, we, we fired through a lot of those slides pretty quickly, but I know there's actually a lot of really great content there, particularly for people who are just starting to work with this type of data. Do you think we could link a copy of that in the show notes so that if people want to go back and refer to it, that we'd be able to do that? Uh, I think I can find a way. Okay, great. Good. Both, 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 both these slides and any that might have ended up on the cutting room floor, sure. Uh, Chris, uh, I'll maybe just give you a chance to give a couple minutes of closing comments if you have um, any thoughts on where we are now and where you hope the field heads in the future. Yeah, I mean, maybe just really, I mean, thanks to both of you. It's been a really sort of invigorating chat, so, so thank you for that. I mean, that's my, my, my closing thought is just to express a lot of gratitude for what 
you and your teams and almost the the academic side of this uh this, this sort of joint journey are, are doing because without you know kind of people like matt like like you pushing for the pre-registration really explaining the importance of you know we we're going to use the data no matter what it tells us um, okay i mean Harvard is in a position where people are coming to you to ask to work with you. So that, that you're, you're in a, but we need people like you to use that negotiating leverage to help shift those industry norms. So just, and you know, the, the BWIN data set, it was, was seminally transformative for people trying to work with industry data and really opened up the field beyond and like a small group of people on industry or a small people with relationships. So it's just so important. And we just need, we kind of need a volume of this. So particularly when, when we're engaging with regulators to talk about the, the different types of insights you can draw from different sources because they've got they've got surveys of, of consumers they've got insight from uh, treatment providers and they've got the, the kind of gambling behavioral data generated here and they almost need a volume of this to kind of get more familiar with its pros its cons what you can do with it and if 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 those insights were only coming from industry-led research they would rightly you know they would rightly be challenged so it's so important that we've got kind of a big surge in your know, volume of output being led from really arm's length relationships as well as industry insiders as and kind of every step along that journey. And kind of stuff like kind of you've been doing and kind of building bridges between it, having worked on the operator side and then in academia and moving between the two. And I okay, I, I don't know how, how quickly ideas get picked up, but even pushing for ideas around incentivizing operators through the tax code to kind of engage with these things and take them more seriously. We, we kind of need ideas like this being pushed. Otherwise, I, you know, I, I worry that in, in 10 years time, we won't have made the same progress that has been made over the last 10 years. I think the, the field has made progress working with industry data, but I, I kind of, there, there, are, there are leaps yet to come. We, kind of, we can't stop yet. So just a, yeah, an expression of gratitude and, and, a, and an urge to, to keep on at it. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of really great points in there. Uh, Matt, any closing comment? Oh, not really. Just, um, you know, I agree with the whole idea, um, the, the ideas of uh, open science, open data. I guess the one piece that I didn't talk about is open code. So not just here's the data set, but here's what I did with it and how. Here's uh, how I filtered. Here's how I dealt with edge cases uh, so that, uh, other researchers who are dealing with the same data set, who something like the Transparency Project or future data sets, uh, don't have to reinvent the wheel or don't make uh, some of the same mistakes. So yeah, just continue to evolve, continue to move the field forward. I, I wish that I had seen the or known more about the open code plans that were you know coming in the future when I first started you writing code. Because now sometimes a young researcher will ask me, "Hey, can you send me the code for this?" Paper, and I'm just so embarrassed at like how <laughs> unorganized and disjointed it is. I'm like, here it is. If you need any help reading through it, uh, just let me know. But it's not going to be self-evident in many places. <laughs> no, even within yourself, you, you can look at code from let's say five, ten years ago. It's like, well, this garbage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you both very much, Chris, Matt. Uh, really appreciate you coming on, and uh, I know we'll link your contact information. So if anybody has any questions, I'm sure you'd be happy to, to start up a conversation with them. But thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. And of course, thank you, Khalil. And thank you to Chris and Tom for that really interesting discussion, which bounced back and forth over a huge number of topics. But I think there was some really practical takeaways. Um, and it was great to see people discussing these already on the live chat. So um, I think that really was a great way to end our second season of the seminar series because it really highlighted the interplay between research and academia and commercial and other stakeholders. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Please do send comments through, send emails. Uh, let us know if you are interested in season three or we'll see, see how the, the world's going this time next year. 
But it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to host this technology risk and gambling webinar series at the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney. So a huge thank you for everyone who has been involved this season. If you haven't uh, seen all the episodes and you want to go back and check some out, please do. There are podcasts and the YouTube clips all available easily online. And please share them with anyone who might be interested. Uh, so a huge thank you to Khalil, uh, our co-host, and obviously to Tom Swanton, who's been helping us with production this season. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you either virtually or who knows, maybe in person at some stage soon. Thank you and goodbye.